I'm Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, and this is Represent NYC on MNN, the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Today we are going to get into the weeds of city government. We're going to be talking about New York City's charter and this year's Charter Revision Commission. My first two guests are very special. One is Gail Benjamin. She's chair of the 2019 Charter Revision Commission. And the other is James, we call him Jim Karras, who is the Manhattan Borough President appointee to that commission. This year's commission is made up of appointees from all of the borough presidents and the council speaker, the mayor, the controller, and the public advocate. There are a total of 15 commission members. You can find out about these members and a whole lot more at the Charter Review Commission's website, charter2019.nyc. Today we're going to talk about how the commission has been doing its work and also four of the very substantive areas they are examining. First, the city budget. Second, land use and zoning. Three, police accountability. And four, elections and government. So, Let's get started. My friend, GB, because I'm Gail Brewer and she's Gail Benjamin. So we're GB very- GB one and two. GB one and two, you're one, no. <clears throat> I'm two. So tell us a little bit about the history of how this got started and where you'd like to go with the 2019 charter. We're so glad you're the chair. Thank you very much. Well, I think it's important to start from the perspective that every other charter revision commission has been, all of the appointees have been appointed by the mayor. Mm -hmm. So they have been mayor's commission, but the state allows the city council under certain circumstances to appoint a charter revision commission when the mayor has not. Of course, the mayor did, appointed one for 2018 and they finished their work, uh, but this particular commission, as a result of city council legislation that you and Tish James brought to the council, allowed for a representation by all of the citywide elected officials and all of the borough presidents. So there's a very different constituency and they represent a much wider variety of viewpoints and experiences and that has meant that the commission thinks differently than it has in the past. It's not as monolithic, it's not as unanimous. It will be interesting as we continue to delve through some of the issues on where we stand. But I think that's been a good thing overall for the city. Jim, would you? Yeah, Jim, add to it. And um, I think Gail would agree that Jim is the expert on the city charter in many ways. So we're delighted that you're on it. So what's the process? What's your give and Perhaps take on this? One of, I, I think, you know, democracy can be messy. And this <laughs> might be a little messy. But I think having these conversations are a good thing. When you have, you know, mayoral appointed commissions that often last just four, five, six months, I, I don't think there's a lot of discussion about, you know, issues that there isn't already some degree of consensus on. And I think here we're having some of that. Uh, it probably will be more difficult, you know, in the end, but that's, you know, uh, hopefully things that are worth getting to are, are worth a little difficulty in getting there. Uh, so we've had, uh, we started, uh, as Chair Benjamin said, uh, in July of 18 with our first meeting. Uh, we had some, we had our first round of borough hearings in September. Expert panels just wrapped up over the winter uh, in the areas uh, you mentioned, governance, elections, land use, finance. Uh, and now we're going to move on to our second round of borough hearings. And, and do you think this is a good process? Is there is there some way that people know about it, or you know, well, how, what um, do you think about the process? Had, uh, I think it's very important that we hear from the public as much as possible. I, I'm under no illusions that the public has all of the same knowledge or even awareness of the importance of the charter as a document. But we have had a robust outreach to the public. We have a website. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Um, we go to public meetings all the time. Um, I know that we've been at, uh, at community board meetings in, the, in most of the boroughs. We've been at some borough board meetings in some of the boroughs. We've gone to meetings with interested entities or groups or people. We've received written comments both on our website, in writing. As you know, the staff report, based on all of those comments, came out this week. Mm -hmm. 
and that is what we'll be having the borough hearings on starting next week. How do you get, Jim, how do you get people interested in these topics? I mean, I love them. This is our weeds, but it's, it's our constitution. It is, and it's important, and small changes, I think, can make significant differences. Uh, and it is probably not that easy, although I think at our public hearings, our first round of public hearings, our Manhattan hearing started at 6 p.m. and went till 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and people stayed the entire time. So there are people out there that are interested. Uh, I've gone to a couple of libraries to talk to groups of people, uh, a couple of clubs. Uh, I think we're going to do much more of that as we start to, you know, know what our uh, get towards our final basket of proposals. Uh, so, but we really need everybody's help. We need everybody who is interested in this topic to go on our website to read to. Uh, tell organizations that they're affiliated with uh, and, and spread the word. And so thank you both very much for doing this and we look forward to our next guest. Thank you for having us. Thank you. We're back. I'm Gail Brewer, Borough President, and I want to welcome our new guest to talk about the city's budget process. Lisa Neary, who is general counsel at the City Independent Budget Office, or we call it IBO. It's an agency that was itself set up by the Charter Revision Commission, the one in 1989. We are taping this the day after the mayor released his executive budget, which this year amounts to, oh goodness, $92.5 billion. That's a lot of money. But our viewers may be surprised that often there isn't much detail offered by an administration, not just the administration, but about each agency's funding and what gets spent where. So now, Lisa, thank you for joining us. So just tell thank us you. a little about what you think could be reformed. And, you know, this is our chance to reform the budget process. What do you think from your IBO and your city council budget experience? Right. Well, um, sticking with IBO for the moment, um, we, we sent a letter to the commission, as you know, and one of the things we proposed is that the city move more in the direction of presenting the budget in programmatic purposes, which would serve the purpose of allowing people to see um, in these very large spending components that now comprise the budget uh, how spending is being allocated for particular programs and purposes. And as Jim can tell you, the language of the charter would suggest that that should be happening now, but it's not something that happens in practice. Um, so just to illustrate that, in the Department of Homeless Services, there is a unit of appropriation that is over a billion dollars. Um, there exists now a document that's sort of in the background of the city budget process that breaks that unit of appropriate, that very large spending component, down into spending categories. Um, so that you can identify more easily how the city is allocating portions of that large spending allocation to programs like uh, providing adult shelter services or general administration, um, the general administration function of the Department of Homeless Services. Um, we thought it might be interesting for the commission to look at whether you could take that background document and move it more to the forefront of the budget process so that you could use it. It, it doesn't exist now for all city agencies. It's just a few and um, or more than a few, but not all city agencies. And you could more formalize the use of that kind of breakdown into spending categories so that people can look at the budget and understand where the billion dollars plus that's going into this one unit of appropriation in the Department of Homeless Services, where that, where that money is really going in terms of programs. Jim, are people discussing this at the commission and what's the response? Uh, Yes, and I certainly am. I've been <laughs> carrying this around, and it's funny, Lisa mentions the Department of Homeless Services. This is the budget page for the Department of Homeless Services. And as Lisa said, the entire budget is $2.06 billion, $1.9 billion of which is in one, what's called a unit of appropriation. And that means essentially, even though, as Lisa said, there is background documentation that tells you what programs that money goes to fund, but that means that the commissioner of the Department of Homeless Services has no limits 
as to his various types of programs, what he can spend that $1.9 billion on. Because if it's in one unit of appropriation and all the various programs are in that unit of appropriation, it means he gets to decide what to spend the money on, what not to spend the money on. So, Gail, you know this issue well. Is it something that you think the commission will take up? Because it is so important to those of us who, you know, work on the budget. The staff has certainly recommended that we take a look at the units of appropriation and at how we can make where it's being spent and how it's being spent more transparent to the public. Um, and a side factor of that is that under the current charter and current laws, 5% um, of any unit of appropriation can be moved without coming back for a budget modification, which when you have a billion dollars, means that $50 million could be moved in some other direction without coming back to the council, who's the final approver, approval of the budget, or letting the public know in any way, shape, or form. So I believe it will continue to be a discussion, but I really don't know how that discussion will turn out in the long run. So Lisa, in your situation with IBO looking at all day long different aspects of the budget, this would help, I assume, not only the public, but you be yes. able to analyze whether the program and the budget match. Exactly. And these background documents are useful to us, but again, they don't cover all city agencies. And it's not a formal part of the city's budget process. And then one other idea that IBO has been kicking around um, just to mention is, uh, you know, we have, thanks to the 1989 Charter Commission, we have really strong access to information authority under the city charter vis-a-vis -vis the traditional city agencies. But we don't have explicitly that same kind of access to information in relation to city-affiliated entities. These are uh, organizations like Health and Hospitals or the Economic Development Corporation, they provide vital services to the city, um, but IBO uh, as an oversight agency and other oversight agencies do not have the same sort of explicit access to information from those agencies, so we can't do the sort of full-blown oversight that we'd like to, and we thought it would be important for the commission to look at whether the charter could be changed to allow for that more explicit access to information from those city-affiliated entities. So Lisa Neary, thank you for joining us. I could discuss this all <laughs> night long because I love the budget. <laughs> but thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank Thanks you very me. much. Um, and we want to, again, thank Lisa Neary for being with us. And we'll be right back. We're back. I'm Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, and I'm so delighted to welcome Elena Conte, who's the Policy Director at the Pratt Center for Community Development. We love Pratt. And she's here to talk with us about land use and zoning processes. So, Elena, thank you so much. So I guess my big question is comprehensive land use planning. How could we get the Charter Revision Commission to consider it? And do you think it's a good idea, or am I like, crazy about that idea because no. I am crazy about it I'll tell you. <laughs> no I think it's a fabulous idea and I really applaud your leadership on it uh uh, Madam Borough President, um, and I think there's a, a couple of things that we aim for with it, right? So it's cohesive, coherent, transparent, and inclusive. That's Those are goals that we would want in our planning system, um, and that right now our system's not accomplishing that. So um, let me attempt to kind of demystify a couple parts of what we think mm -hmm. are part of this framework um, uh, that are important to accomplishing those goals because, um, you know, why do we care about a cop plan? Uh, because we want to overcome equality, right? We want that fair and just city. So it's a tool for that. Um, so the first part of it is actually stating that really clearly, right? So having a clear statement of goals that we're aiming for that and naming racial and economic justice as part of it and naming other important goals like environmental uh, and the climate change realities that we are dealing with, we need to be pointing at that if we're going to accomplish those, right? The second piece is that we need a collective way to get to what are our needs, right? So a process that includes folks to look at the citywide needs and also includes the neighborhood needs and brings those pieces together in a needs assessment. Um, with that, we can set neighborhood-wide goals, right, um, that uh, help us advance uh, the priorities that communities have, right, and also uh, identify the ways that every neighborhood is going to be contributing to these important citywide goals. Now, the piece that is absolutely critical, and you just talked about it in the other segment, is the budget alignment, right? Because although this is lovely language, sounds nice, documents, plans, but it's 
it's got to be tied with the dollars, right? Both on the capital side and to the extent feasible, right, on the programmatic side. That's what makes it have meaning for folks. Uh, and ultimately, the last piece is that we're going to measure and report back so that we can see how we're doing, right? We set the goals, are we meeting the goals? And in the event that, that we're not, we can then course correct and innovate policy solutions to make ourselves a more equal silly. Great, Elena. So, Gail, you were the head of land use for many years <laughs> in the city council. Um, this is, uh, you're the perfect person to be trying to lead this, but it is a bit of a fractured uh, system. What would you suggest or what do you think the, is being discussed in terms of this really complicated issue? What I heard in all five boroughs throughout the city was people asking for government to present the idea of where they thought New York and their community would be in the future, and that they wanted to have a role in having a meaningful impact on that picture. Mm -hmm. The staff has come back and has done a lot of work on this topic, and they've come back and said, we have all of these plans, and this was a fear that was expressed by, in the expert testimony. We have all of these plans that no one ever looks at. Mm -hmm. They get done every two years or every four years or every ten years or, and they go in a drawer somewhere in offices around the city and no one uses them as a real planning tool or very few people do. And they certainly don't inform the other plans. So when you have your ten year financial plan and your ten year capital plan, it is not necessarily being informed by the sustainability plan that is required mm -hmm. every four years I believe. So what the staff has proposed is that we take a look at all of those plans we already do and require and figure out how to sequence them so that they are, in fact, informing towards these bigger plans mm -hmm. and invite the public to be a part of it. So uh, this pre does it fall under the pre-planning? Would this help with our pre-planning notion? Well, I think it would in terms of communities having input into goals and what this plan looks like, uh, which you know I, I hope could also take into account uh, some aspects of fair share and where growth might occur, should occur. Uh, and But we're also considering, uh, the staff recommended, uh, to consider some kind of pre-planning <clears throat> Uh, time period before a uniform land use review application, which are for big zoning and planning changes, uh, such as a neighborhood rezoning, uh, before that occurs. And we've always, and I know in the borough president's office, uh, where I've worked the last five years, uh, that's always been an issue for big actions, uh, because people feel like once it's certified into ULERP, it's 90% baked and they're just tinker the community boards, the borough president, uh, are just sort of tinkering around the edges. This might give people an upfront uh, opportunity to weigh in on what the application should look like before city planning sends it out for Got review. It. Elena Condi, thank you so much. We love Pratt. We appreciate your being here. And we'll be right back with our next guest. We're back again. I'm Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President. And now we're really delighted to be joined by John, also Jonathan Darsh, who's Executive Director of the NYC, New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board, known as CCRB to all of us. He's going to talk about the Charter Vision Commission's look at police accountability review. And I have to say, John, is probably the most important topic in terms of the public. So we really appreciate you being here today. Thank you for having me. So I guess give us a little bit about what you think in terms of the CCRB should be the recommendations for the future, because I know you were started in 89, and now with all this experience, you have some ideas of how it could be improved. So the agency has put forward four changes to the charter. Uh, the first would be uh, to link our budget to the uh, NYPD's budget. Mm -hmm. The second would be to codify the APU. The third would be... I know what APU is, but oh, can you describe me. it to the... The Administrative Prosecution Unit. In okay. 2012, there was a memorandum of understanding signed between the NYPD and the CCRB 
that created an administrative prosecution unit yeah. that will that allows the CCRB in the most serious cases where the CCRB has substantiated misconduct against a member of the NYPD to prosecute the cases in the trial room at uh, One Police Plaza. And it has been a huge success and we want to put it in the charter. Right. Uh, the, the, the current charter has imposes a duty to cooperate with the CCRB on the NYPD and the, the board has suggested some tweaks to that to make it stronger. And the fourth thing is to uh, give the board the ability to designate to certain executive staff members the power to sign subpoenas. Gail, what do you think? Many of the people who came to our hearing spoke about having an elective CCRB as the response. Uh, however, the staff did not think that was both practicable um, or necessary and thought that giving CCRB more tools was the better way to go. All of the other members who came were very complimentary of the job that CCRB does and of how they work. Um, and what we heard from the public, what I took my takeaway from the public meetings was that people would like to feel that the accountability for the police, for individual police officers is there and is transparent. That one way they thought would be an elective CCRB, but I think that what they asked for is in fact embodied in what Frank has suggested and what the staff has recommended. Yeah. John, are you feeling that this is some play, these uh, suggestions would really make a difference in terms of transparency and maybe getting away from the fact that the community feels, and I agree, elected makes sense, not to me, but at all. But do you feel like these would get at what people are feeling in terms of their frustration? Yes. One of the main hurdles to transparency in the discipline process at the NYPD, not just on CCRB cases, but on all cases, is Civil Rights Law 50A, which puts a real damper on the amount of information that the department and the CCRB can share with the public. But there are still things that we can do to provide transparency within the rubric that 50A imposes. And one of those things has been the Administrative Prosecution Unit. In the year and a half before the AP went into effect, none of the cases in which the board recommended uh, charges against a member of service went to trial. In the, in the time since the, AP, uh, the memorandum of understanding has gone into effect, the administrative prosecution unit has brought charges in the trial room against more than 350 members of the NYPD. And that's really the only uh, glimpse into the disciplinary process that the public has. The trials are open to the public and uh, we put the calendar on our website so if there is something that people are interested in they can go and see the trials and that kind of uh, insight and transparency I think is vital to people believing in the process. Well I want to congratulate you I'm afraid we're out of time John but I want to congratulate you because this is a topic no matter we can talk about units of appropriation and pre-planning but I have to be honest with you the public is incredibly interested even more so in CCRB, but I also feel like you have done a really good job in bringing it even to this point, because that I hear also. Thank so, you very much. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, John for being with us, and we'll be right back. I'm Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, and I'm here with Susan Lerner, who is the Executive Director of Common Cause, to talk about possible changes to the city charters election and governance section. So thank you, Susan. I know you know this topic extremely well. <laughs> Thanks, so Gil. I think to talk specifically about what I call uh, ranked choice, instant runoff, and then there's a wonderful acronym, IRV. And I joked yesterday when we had the press conference that it should become a household name and then we get our what we want. Wait, you mean Irving? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we want to know how is an improvement over current elections sure. and what you think the commission should be doing. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is actually suggest a uniform language change. And we, what we're advocating for is ranked choice voting, which would be allowing the voters to rank their top five choices for all city offices as opposed to an instant runoff system where you're only using the ranking 
for a small number of citywide offices in order to avoid the expense of a runoff. If you have a full rank choice voting system for all of the offices, and we suggest for primary and special, then you get the benefits of an instant runoff system and you have the benefits of the ranking for the other offices. Because when we've done an analysis of our elections here in New York City, what we found is that we have an unusually high number of multi-candidate races, particularly in the primaries. That is a happy consequence of two things, that we have term limits and we have a very robust and very popular public financing system. So that encourages people to run. Um, often we'll see candidates, uh, multiple candidates from the same community. So in a district that has Asians and African Americans and Latinos, that you may get multiple candidates from each one of those communities. Being able to rank your choices means that you don't have to settle for any candidate other than the one you really like. Even if you're told that candidate doesn't have a good chance of winning, you're not going to waste your vote. That candidate isn't a spoiler. And often what we see is if you have two or three candidates from the same ethnic community, they're told, oh, no, no, there should only be one of you running because only one of you is going to win. You're going to split your community's vote. If you rank, you avoid all of those issues. And most importantly, what we see with all of these multiple candidate races is all too frequently the ultimate winner is not uh, winning with the majority. And I think a perfect example is our recent special election for public advocate. There, the winner, clear winner, clearly the choice of a lot of people, still our current public advocate was chosen with a 33% plurality. When you have ranked choice voting, the ultimate winner is the consensus choice of the majority of the people who voted. I mean, I think the purpose of all of these changes is to increase the voter turnout and to remove voter apathy or ignorance about what is happening, when it's happening, and who is running for what offices. And to the extent that any of these ideas can do that, I think we ought to, to look at them further. Susan, you want to add anything about ranked choice or anything else? You know, I just, I just think it's important for um, all of us to see it as an opportunity uh, to really make our democracy even stronger and to deal with uh, unexpected um, consequences of as what I've said is a very strong campaign finance system. Right, I agree. So Susan Lerner, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate all your work and unfortunately we're out of time. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of my guests today for joining in the discussion of the 2019 Charter Review Commission's efforts to help make New York City government work better. Thanks especially to Gail Benjamin, chair of the 2019 Charter Revision Commission, and Jim Karras, the Manhattan Borough President's appointee to the commission, who are here with me for all four segments. Now I expect everyone watching to attend the next Manhattan hearing of the Charter Revision Commission on Thursday, May 9th, 2019 at City Hall at 6 p.m. And let us know what you think, all of your ideas. Stay tuned to the Charter Commission's website, charter2019.nyc, for more details on the process. And again, I'm Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President. You can follow me and my staff on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. On all three <laughs> services, the handle is Gail A. Brewer. And if you'd like updates on our office's work and what's going on in Manhattan and the charter proposals, sign up for our newsletter at manhattanbp.nyc.gov. Subscribe. This has been Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you. Mm -hmm.